This is CBC Here and Now. I can't help but feel and wonder, what are you keeping from me? Her daughter died in custody. Tonight, she questions why it took so long to get answers. Bars and lounges will be reopening this Thursday, but there won't be any dancing or karaoke. We'll have more on those Alert Level 2 guidelines coming up on Here and Now. Well, it's a hot, sticky, humid day across many parts of this province. All the time we've spent indoors, it's great to be able to get out. Even Ted got his COVID haircut. And I'll tell you how people are enjoying this beautiful summer weather. Welcome to Here and Now, those stories in just a few moments. But first, the mother of a woman who died in custody two years ago is once again speaking out. Lisa Piercy questions why it took a year and a half to get her hands on a report into the deaths of four inmates in the province. Here and Now's Arianna Kellant reports. This is one of Samantha's favorite spots. She loved coming here and her childhood friend made this bench in her memory. I feel she's here with me. A bittersweet moment for a mother in anguish, a mother who vows to keep fighting for her daughter. The latest chapter involves this report from Dr. Keith Courtney with Alberta Health Services, a look into the health care given to four inmates, including Samantha Piercy. It was never released publicly, and Lisa Piercy says it took eight months after it was finished to see the report and a year and a half to get a copy. I can't help but feel and wonder, what are you keeping from me? There's no respect. It seems like they're not t taking my daughter's death seriously. Uh, transparency is needed. CBC has a copy of the recommendations stemming from the report. Dr. Courtney notes communications failures, the right hand not knowing what the left was doing. Staff noted that suicide watches, recent violence, mental health and medical conditions were often not shared between health care and corrections. In Samantha Piercy's case, she died by suicide. The signs were there, her mother says, but they were ignored. In the case of my daughter's death, I believe at least two, but in my heart I believe three should lose their jobs over this. Lisa Piercy is suing the province for her and for Samantha's little girl. She has few answers to give her. She still don't understand why they didn't look after mommy. Why they're not telling her they're sorry. I tried to reassure her and it's hard when I don't believe it that they are sorry. Meanwhile, a spokesperson from the health department says redacted copies of the report were prepared for families once the report was submitted to government. Since then, a director for correctional health services has been hired. Government says the announcement of this report and the recommendations were delayed because of COVID-19. Four of the 15 recommendations have been implemented so far. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Less than 48 hours until the province hits alert level two when more of the economy reopens. Bars, gyms, yoga studios, recreational facilities are gearing up to reopen on Thursday. Health officials released new guidelines today for bars. Here in Meg Roberts explains. In two days, George Street and bars and lounges will be able to reopen across the province. And today, business owners are getting some of those guidelines. So here is what you can expect starting Thursday. There should be physical distancing in all areas. Patrons are asked to stay at their table or bar as much as possible without visiting nearby tables and a maximum of 50% normal capacity is recommended. Now bar and lounge owners are being asked to keep the guests outside until seated and also to keep contact information for possible tracing. Although Newfoundland and Labrador is a province built on song and dance, live musical performances will have to be pushed back from the crowd or a physical barrier will have to be put in place. Only two singers are allowed and they're asking owners to keep the volume down to discourage shouting. Dance floors and karaoke areas will not be allowed. Video lottery terminals will also be turned back on, but they're going to be spaced out a little bit and the machines will have to be disinfected after every use. Health officials are encouraging businesses to come up with digital menus, large chalkboards or online ordering systems instead of traditional menus. 
and you also won't be seeing salt, pepper, or ketchup on the table. And an increase in overall sanitizing is recommended, especially in those high traffic areas. Now with 48 hours left to go, businesses on George Street are left scrambling to come up with a game plan. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, a lot of questions about the new rules as we head into alert level two. Peter Callen will be here in about 25 minutes and we'll try to answer some of those questions. Meanwhile, two coffee shops will not be reopening. The two second cup locations in St. John's have become permanent casualties of the COVID-19 pandemic. The company announced to customers on Facebook that its location on Stavanger Drive and the location inside the Avalon Mall will not reopen. The company says with the forced closure during the snowstorm back in January and now the pandemic, it had to make the difficult business decision to shut down permanently. Well, another casualty of the pandemic, jobs at Saltwire owned newspapers. Many of the temporary layoffs at Saltwire, which owns the Telegram newspaper, are now permanent. Saltwire gave notice to 109 employees throughout Atlantic Canada who were already on a temporary layoff that their positions had been cut permanently. 25 of those jobs are in this province. Those employees stopped working back in March when Saltwire announced temporary layoffs. It also required pay cuts to some staff by reducing their work weeks. Some employees on temporary layoffs will be rehired. The company says the cuts are related to a sharp drop in ad sales because of the pandemic. It says Saltwire has witnessed the devastating impact of COVID-19 on advertising sales with ad cancellations costing millions to date without expected improvement in the coming months. Well, it's officially summer and today the weather definitely matched the season. Heat warnings were in place today in central Newfoundland and on the West Coast, making it feel like 37 degrees in places. We sent here and now's Colleen Connors out in the sticky heat for this report. Temperatures hit 30 degrees today with the humidity feeling like 40. That didn't stop people from getting out for a walk around town or even enjoying a nice lunch in the park. It's beautiful. Sims and her pup know how to beat the heat. Lemonades. <laughs> Lemonade, iced coffee, uh, maybe a little bit of running through the hoses with my nephews, things like that. Because of the COVID-19 health restrictions, parts of the park are closed but people can still get out and walk around. Actually, because we don't get a very long summer, so we want to take advantage of it. And after all this COVID-19 uh, restrictions and all the indoor, that we, all the time we've spent indoors, it's great to be able to get out. Even Ted got his COVID haircut. He's usually a fluffy palm, so we're getting him outside as well. The sticky, muggy weather is being felt from St. John's to Cornerbrook today, keeping most people inside and many under their fans. But this couple decided to soak up the rays. Close to our workplace. Yes, so. yeah, so it's lunch break, so I suggested we do a picnic in the park. A tough day for laborers with the sun blasting down on their backs. Unless this is your job today, to inspect the sprinkler system. Oh, it'd be so nice to be running through that splash pad right now, but of course it's not open to the public just yet. But the city crews are preparing the Margaret Bowater Park area for spectators and kids to come real soon. And luckily, we're going to have some more weather in the coming days. So hopefully kids can enjoy this place soon. I might have to go jump through that, though, because it is super hot. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. That's right, Colleen, another couple of days to enjoy this heat and humidity like I am right now in Petty Harbor. Absolutely gorgeous afternoon and evening on tap. Uh, as we head through the next couple of days, there is some rain on the way for some areas, but I'll have all those details coming up. Well, no heat alerts in St. John's today, but that didn't mean the temperatures didn't climb. Many people got out to enjoy the sunshine. It was a busy day down at Kitty Vitty Lake if you were walking the dog or letting them cool off. Uh, the Bannerman Park was also a busy spot with people lounging on the grass and in their hammocks. Not a bad way to spend the day. Well, firefighters are calling an early morning house fire in Mount Pearl suspicious. 
A neighbor noticed the fire around 1.30 this morning on Loman Street and called for help. When crews arrived, that neighbor was fighting the fire with a garden hose. The fire was contained to the front porch area, but crews believe an accelerant may have been used. They could see and smell fuel. Firefighters found a sleeping woman and her adult son inside and were able to get them out of the house. Police are asking anyone with information about what happened to contact the force. Well, on the Buren Peninsula, a woman is facing arson charges as the RCMP believes she intentionally set a business on fire seven months ago. The fire happened in Seniors Seaside Takeout and Gas Bar and Garnish on November 20th. Police say someone was inside an apartment attached to the business at the time, but they weren't injured. Police say video surveillance led to the arrest. She's facing three charges, arson, disregard for human life and arson for a fraudulent purpose. The 41 year old has been released from custody on conditions. Well, another fire this one uh, this morning in Corner Brook, a popular pub on Broadway was set to reopen Thursday, but caught fire today. A fire started around 8 a.m. near the fridges in the basement of Flynn's Pub. The pub was empty at the time. Flynn's Pub has been closed to the public during the COVID-19 pandemic. Firefighters with the Cornerbrook Department arrived on the scene at 8.30 and quickly put out the blaze. Flynn's Pub has extensive smoke damage and it's not clear how the fire started. Upon arrival, we had a building that was heavily charged with smoke. Uh, crews made a rapid entry. Uh, discovered a, a fire in the basement, uh, was able to contain the fire to the room of origin and extinguish the fire relatively quickly. So in a window of about 25 minutes, the situation was well under control. Well, the provincial government has made Anne Chafe the permanent head of the rooms. Chafe has been the acting CEO for nearly a year now, ever since the government fired her predecessor, Dean Brinton. He had held the job uh, there for 14 years. The province never explained why Brinton was fired. It happened in the wake of the Carla Foote hiring scandal. Chafe took over the CEO position last July as an interim measure, moving up from leading museums and galleries. Calories. The move was recommended by the province's so Independent Appointments Commission. Well, to the Liberal leadership race now, candidate Andrew Fury says if he becomes the next Premier, he'll cut the cost of daycare for all families in the province. In a news release, he says he will work towards the goal of implementing $25 a day child care by 2022. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives says the average cost of child care in this province is around $1,000 a month. At $25 a day, that cost would drop to around $500. Now, Fury wasn't available today to answer questions, but he will be taking part in a debate on Here and Now with his opponent, John Abbott, on Thursday night. Well, in other news tonight, the East Coast Music Awards will be held in about two weeks, but it'll be different than it used to be. Instead of a live show, it will be pre-recorded, a two-hour program. We're lucky to be gathered here all together to celebrate the extraordinary music of the Atlantic provinces. The awards will air as a two hour pre recorded show on CBC Television and CBC Gem on Saturday, July 11th. It's hosted by Mary Walsh and will feature a number of performances from Atlantic Canadian musicians. And it'll feature a tribute to Ron Hines to celebrate his induction into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. Well, tech company Verifin made a French fry fantasy come true today. A couple of weeks ago, CBC spoke with a resident at Bonaventure Retirement Home in St. John's about what lockdown looked like for her inside a care facility. She said more than anything, she was craving a plate of chips. So this afternoon, the charity arm of the company delivered. Here and now's Katie Breen put this together. So behind us today we have uh, the Bear Cares Committee. We, uh, we seen a, an article on CBC not that long ago where Mrs. B, when the pandemic was over, she said she wanted to get a plate of chips. So at Bear Cares we heard about this and uh, we jumped to the task. Do you realize you're the ringleader of this today? Yeah. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we have a pretty good relationship with uh, Bonaventure. We come down here 
four or five times a year. You know, these are Verifin people singing and playing for them, and we have different events like bingo and stuff, and uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's a break from inside. It was good, and the food was good. Did you love I enjoyed the chips. Oh, indeed. That's her favorite yeah. meal is French fries. French fries. And a slice of bread with no butter. That's right. Right on. No butter on no it. No butter on it, just a slice of bread. Yeah. And, I would never use the butter. <laughs> <laughs> So Verifin's mission is to fight crime. So as Veracares, we try to pair with charities that uh, are victims of financial crime. So, you know, we have analytics that help fight elder abuse, uh, victims of human trafficking. So we partner with organizations like Bonaventure to come out and, and help uh, help out the seniors and spend the days with them and, and give them some, you know, some fun times. So how do you think you're going to make it through the rest of the pandemic? I don't know. I, I don't think I'm going to make too much longer. Why, where are you going? No, no. Listen, only the good die young, so you and I are going to live forever. That's right. I, I live, right, but I live forever. COVID-19 forced people who normally go to the gym to be stuck indoors, and that led one fitness trainer to come up with an online solution. Less talking, more working, Jeremy. Let's go. I'm Jeremy Eaton. That story coming up on Here and Now.
update is brought to you by the sold-out HCF Home Lottery. Thank you, Newfoundland and Labrador. Your support has been overwhelming. Prize winners will be announced on June 25th at hcfhomelottery.ca. Welcome to summer. What an absolutely gorgeous day across most of the province, really. We've got a number of heat warnings in place. I came down uh, to Petty Harbour in the, on a floating dock tonight to do the weather because it just seems like this is the perfect place to do it. So let's take a look at where those temperatures were sitting this afternoon into the high 20s. 26 degrees in St. John's, 29 in Gander, Twillingate even reaching a high near 28 degrees and then 30 was the high in Corner Brook today. And uh, with that humidity really is the story. Uh, feeling closer to 36 in Deer Lake and uh, hot and humid in St. John's as well. Feeling uh, around 33 this afternoon. So no surprise that there is a heat warning in place. And you're looking at Humidex values really through Thursday, uh, reaching anywhere from 34 to 37 with those actual temperatures anywhere from 28 to 30 degrees. You may be wondering why eastern areas of the island are seeing these warm temperatures, but not under the heat warning, and that's because we're just below that warning criteria. So regardless, it is going to be a warm one over the next couple of days. And as we head through the evening tonight, we are looking at the risk of some thunderstorms developing. That line of convective cloud cover is developing. You can see it as the things start to clear out, but you can see that line there through the interior. That's pretty much where we're going to see that risk tonight. Even southeastern areas of Labrador looking at that risk of thunderstorms. And it should happen within the next few hours and then clearing skies as we head through the night tonight. We'll see some areas of fog and drizzle and cooler temperatures, though, unfortunately, sticking around for southern areas. Uh, but overall, it's going to be a very mild evening for uh, most areas in the 16 to 18 degree range overnight tonight. Port of Basque around 11 degrees, but again, looking at that potential for drizzle. Some fog patches too, uh, as well along coastal areas. Up through Labrador, you're looking at about 16 degrees for Lab City, so a mild night for you as well. And uh, unfortunately, we're just looking at some showers uh, through the overnight. As we head through the day tomorrow, not a whole lot happening, maybe some showers in the morning, but overall, those uh, main system will be up through Labrador. So we are looking at the risk of some thunderstorms, mainly for southeastern portions. Uh, I'm thinking all that thunderstorm activity should stay south of Happy Valley Goose Bay as well as Lab City, but going to keep that in there for southeastern Labrador. Otherwise, sticking with that onshore flow, so areas along the south coast, you're looking at uh, the potential for some cooler temperatures and then again temperatures in the 20s and even 30 degree range for tomorrow afternoon with that heat and humidity sticking around. Uh, 21 for Mary's Harbor, 23 for Lab City and Happy Valley Goose Bay you should be sitting around 15 degrees tomorrow afternoon. As we head into Thursday there's those more temperatures 26 to 30 degrees plenty of sunshine on tap. Uh, unfortunately again though in that southern flow we're looking at uh, coastal areas southern coastal areas uh, the risk of some showers and cooler temperatures. 21 degrees will be the afternoon high in Lab City. Once we get through this heat wave, uh, temperatures are going to dip, going to turn cloudy as well at this point for the weekend, anywhere from 19 to 15 to 19 degrees for your weekend. So far in St. John's, Eastern Newfoundland, Central Newfoundland, you're going to see that dip as well. Uh, as of now, I have 12 degrees for Sunday. That'll probably jump around a little bit. And then same thing for Western Newfoundland. By Sunday, you'll see your temperatures dip into the teens. Up through Labrador, eastern areas, uh, teen temperatures pretty much right through Friday, and then we'll uh, be back into the potential for some sunshine by the weekend. And then same thing for western Labrador with a high near 18 degrees on Sunday. Had to share this great shot. Pretty picture perfect in Port Rex. And thank you so much to Cal Vincent for sending that in. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, gorgeous. I'd love to be sitting in that chair. Thanks so much, Ashley. COVID-19 has left a lot of people stuck indoors, unable to go to the gym. But one St. John's personal trainer came up with an idea to combat that. And her name is Jill Whalen. She joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Jill. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. So what idea did you come up with? Well, it was an idea that I actually had in the works pre-pandemic, and the pandemic just allowed me the time to finalize the content and push it out there. What I was trying to create after 12 years in the fitness industry here was a fitness solution that would be that would fit absolutely every person, regardless of age, size, shape, fitness level, time zone, or schedule. So what did you create? How, how, do, how do people work out if they can't get in and out of a gym? Jill? It's called a virtual boot camp. 
So my virtual boot camp, I stream live classes from my basement in my house, and I have virtually hundreds of people join me every day. Up, uh, squeeze. And I told myself, if I could get probably a good group of 20 people to work with me on this, in this fashion, I think it could be a huge success. But in the first month, we had 120 participants, which was so exciting. It was above and beyond what I expected to get. And what happened in month number two? How, how did it continue to grow, but how did it grow? In month number two, we had a 97% retention rate and doubled our clientele to 250 people in month number two. In month number three, we were still up in the 90s for retention rate, and we now have, we're closing in on 700 members. 700 people, is 700 that 700 members. people in St. John's? Or? No, actually, which is the most exciting part, and which is part of my mission to bring this, this approach, uh, my system globally. We have members in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, Alberta, BC, the Yukon, Nunavut, uh, Tennessee in the US, and also the UK. Up to the legs. I get to go on my own schedule. The biggest things I found with the boot camp was that it was anytime, anywhere, anybody. So you can do it whenever you want. You, if you're a shift worker, you can do it in the night, you can do it in the morning, you can do it whenever you want at any time and anywhere, like in, internationally. And anybody can do it as well, which I found really interesting because I might be at a, a bit more of advanced level because I've been with Jill for so long, but I have friends who are in this as well and they use one and three and five pound weights and my husband's doing it with me and he's using 35 pound weights. So it's really, really scalable, which I really love. And the last exercise is a plank or a Spider-Man plank. Record the Zoom recordings, upload them to my private Facebook group for my members and they can access it there. As we grow, we have plans for other, other uh, platforms, but that's how it's working for now. So as most people who have used Facebook know that people like, like and comment, does that, do people do that in the group? Do they share selfies or thanks for this? Jill? Yes. Like, so is there a sense of community, is it, I guess is what I'm asking Yes, about. so orientation to my program, we run in a four week block and I always run an orientation the night before we begin so that everybody understands my coaching philosophies and how this program is structured. It's based on a four pillar system. Once they understand that, then they know every day the accountability aspect, how they can check in with me, how I can measure their progress and how we can make sure that they're progressing. Touch the left shoulder. She's able to motivate me just as much as I think she would be if we were face to face together in the gym. And my daughter comes upstairs into the room where I work out and I think she thinks Jill is in there with me. This has completely changed everything for me when it comes to COVID. It's my physical health, my mental health, my ability to stay motivated during my work day. It, it's just been, I, don't, I can't imagine what this would have been like for me if I didn't have the boot camp. Okay, kick your butt. Kick your butt. My approach Let's to fitness is different than a lot of instructors on. and I, a lot of instructors and I like to say that it's a really unique approach because it's a 365 degree approach toward wellness, toward health and wellness. It's not just a fat loss program or a weight loss program or a muscle gain program. Those things are side effects from what I teach. So the four pillars are nutrition, hydration, movement and mindset. And one of those is not more important than the other. It takes all four. Yes, keep it going. Honestly, it's a completely judgment-free zone and it's a safe space to feel comfortable and really work out with others that are there to help motivate you and make you feel positive at the same time. Every workout is designed for your specific need and if you have any kind of aversion or any kind of injuries and you reach out to Jill, she's more than happy to accommodate with you and encourage you to work around those so that you stay in that positive mindset. Here we go! because I do believe that the future of group fitness will look differently from this point forward. I think that there's going to be, for many parts of our world, there's gonna be a pre-COVID and there's gonna be a post-COVID way that we do things. And this is, group fitness is certainly going to feel that. So I believe that this is the best solution. It's hard to describe to you how it feels like we're together in the morning when we do this workout. I average about 200, 250 people live with me at 6 a.m. We'd never all fit in a room, first of all, <laughs> to begin with, but we're together. It really feels like we're together doing the exercises. Beautiful work this morning. That is how we do Monday, my friends, in week two. Alert Level 2 starts this Thursday. How will your life change as even more pandemic restrictions are eased? Peter Cowan is here to break it all down for us, coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, we are just days away before the province moves to alert level two. Starting on Thursday, we'll see some big changes, more businesses reopening, the easing of more social restrictions. There are a lot of questions out there about how all of this will work, and Peter Cowan is here to break it down for us. So, Peter, let's start with some of the reopenings. Bars will be allowed to reopen on Thursday, but it will not be business as usual. What kind of changes can people expect? How will that scene look? Yeah, if you're going down to George Street, uh, it will not be the sort of big dance uh, a thing that you're sort of used to in big clubs. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look. So uh, you'll be assigned to a table or a bar area. So the idea is not that people are floating around mingling. You kind of have an area and you stick to it. No dance floors or no karaoke. Dancing. I know, that'll take a lot of the fun out of bars for a lot of people. No mingling, no dancing. And no singing. Oh. Um, because they want to, the concern is you've got everyone handling the same microphone. There are concerns that singing, you're going to produce more droplets. Um, and there can be live music, but a limited number of people. They've got to be distanced, all that jazz. And when we talk about music, a lower level of music to discourage shouting. Oh, interesting. Right. So the idea being that if you've got people who are trying to have a conversation and the music's really loud, so what do they do? Well, they start shouting. So mm -hmm. they now send those little droplets further. Or what do, what do they do? Well, they lean in closer because they can't hear the other person. And if you're trying to keep people distant, then that doesn't really work out. So Kind of like the House of Assembly where they said no shouting on the floor because of the droplets. Right, if they can't shout in the House of Assembly, you can't shout in the bar, those are the rules. Yeah, it hasn't really worked there yet though. <laughs> so uh, what about the VLTs? A lot of people were talking about that early on. What's the situation with those? Yeah, after a couple of months of no slot machines, they are going to be back. Uh, so they're gonna have to be two meters apart. I know this is gonna be an issue for a lot of the smaller, more cramped bars. Um, and if they can't be two meters apart, you kind of have to shut down every other machine in order to make sure that you have that distancing there. Uh, and they're going to have to be sanitized after every use. So that means someone's in charge of if someone gets up and goes to the washroom and someone else is about to sit down, you've got to wipe it down with the lights all wipes and mm -hmm. uh, try and so that, you know, it's those touch points, the same things that everyone's touching. You don't want to have that. Okay, and some recreational changes as well, some changes to services. Gyms, pools, playgrounds will all get to reopen. Great for the kids and great for people who have been maybe missing the gym, have that COVID-15 <laughs> going on right now. Uh, what kind of restric restrictions will still be in place though? We're still waiting for that guidance. So that, you know, what we were talking about with bars, that just came out today. Uh, so, you know, and we are just a day and a half away from that opening. Uh, but gyms, they still haven't published any guidance on the website. So larger chains like Good Life, I know they've been figuring out their own things. They'll have their own consultants. Smaller independent gyms have still been waiting for that. Uh, so we, we know generally some of the things that are likely to be in there. So a lot of places are talking about booking times to make sure you're not getting large groups of people like right before work or right as people would normally head home. Uh, you know, obviously lots of sanitizing of the machines and the facilities there and uh, you know, it's the physical distancing. So if you've got people sweating and, you know, breathing heavily, you want to make sure that you're maintaining that distancing between individuals. And we'll see all that tape, that caution tape come down around play sets, playground sets outside. Yeah, and I guess the you do have some of those common touch points. It's not like anyone's going to be Lysol wiping the monkey bars, mm -hmm. but outside it is considered a lower risk uh, than inside. And the other thing to remember, of course, is the risk from the disease is going down. That's why we're able to move through these alert levels. They've had the test now of several weeks. We've seen no new cases after the last easing of restrictions. So it, they now feel, okay, it's safe to ease some more restrictions. Okay, what about gathering sizes? You know, house parties, barbecues, it's summertime. People want to do all of those things right now. And uh, more people will be allowed to get together as of Thursday. But what are those rules? Yeah, and if uh, you are a bride who has a wedding planned, then absolutely gathering sizes become really important. Uh, we have heard from Dr. Janice Fitzgerald that they are increasing it. We're going to find out those details tomorrow They've now at the now once weekly COVID briefings. Uh, but she talked a little bit about some of the sizes, giving a hint that it looks like gatherings of 50 people or so may be allowed. Um, certainly gatherings, we are looking to increase gatherings. Um, the uh, 
uh, right now we're looking at increasing that to up to 50. Um, but there will be some, um, you know, some cautions and uh, certainly any indoor gatherings that are happening um, in your home, that wouldn't apply to gatherings in your home, that would apply to distance gatherings and that's how we'll be referring to them as distance gatherings so that people are maintaining physical distancing. Yeah, so it's not have 50 people for a dinner party, yeah. it's in a large venue where you can maintain some of that distancing. Okay, what about staycations? Government has, talking, has been talking a lot about promoting tourism within the province, hoping to give the tourism industry a bit of a boost with some local uh, travelers. Uh, any new details coming out about that? So we're going to find out more about that at 9.45 this evening. It's a bit of an odd time Very. for a government news conference, but uh, the minister in charge is going to be doing that at uh, at uh, Signal Hill uh, in front of Cabot Tower. So we'll get some more details. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a marketing push. So, you know, blasting people with lots of ads about all the great opportunities there are to vacation within their own province. So let's talk about bubbles now. Uh, we've been hearing about bubbles for months and months. At first it was, you know, bubble within your own household. Then it started expanding to the double bubble and all of that. But and that then the double bubble plus bu six. <laughs> it all got very confusing. But the language is changing on this now. Right, and we heard again from Dr. Fitzgerald that like, when you're talking about your immediate family, bubble makes sense. But now we're kind of more talking about how you manage your interactions because the idea isn't that you're not going to interact with anyone the idea is how do you do that safely and so she talked a little bit about that idea of bubbles and what we might be talking about instead i feel like uh, bubbles have meant something to people people understand what that means and so you know i don't know that we'll get away completely from talking about bubbles when we're talking about your household unit you know your very close contacts um, but uh, really we have to start thinking about moving forward, navigating through the next few months and uh, trying to keep our contacts outside of our bubbles as close, as low as possible. So yeah, so it's about, you know, maintaining that uh, physical distancing and we'll see some more uh, guidelines hopefully tomorrow in terms of, you know, what does that mean for the daily interactions? If you, you know, have a more distant friend who you'd normally get together with once a month, you haven't seen them, you know, can you now invite that person over? Can they have dinner at your house? All those sorts of very practical things that people are trying to figure out because one thing though that I think is going to be important to keep an eye on going forward is not the idea so much of rules, but a lot of these, what they're talking about is guidelines. Mm -hmm. and. The guidelines meaning there are some things that are riskier and some things that are not as risky. And there is no 100% guarantee that if you follow all these rules, you won't get COVID. Just in the same way that if you break all the rules, there's no guarantee you will get COVID. But the idea is helping to identify these are the things that are riskier. And if you can avoid them, here are the things that are less risky and you can feel free to do them. So I think we're going to see a lot more discussion of, you know, what's high risk, what's low risk, and helping people then to make their own decisions about what makes sense for them because, you know, not everyone is in the same health situation, the same social situation, uh, and helping them try and figure out as we all navigate through this together. Yeah, there is so much to navigate. Thank you so much, Peter, for breaking it down for us. My pleasure. This province is facing a financial, economic, and health crisis. How will the next premier lead us through it? Tune in Thursday night for a special edition of Here and Now. Watch Andrew Fury and John Abbott go head to head in a live debate. We want you to get involved. What questions do you have for the two liberal leadership contenders? Email hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca and then tune in Thursday night. One of the most famous tennis players in the world has tested positive for COVID-19. Novak Djokovic, a 17-time Grand Slam champion, revealed his diagnosis today. And as Rob Pizzo reports, his infection seems to be a pretty clear lesson in what not to do during this pandemic. Fresh off hosting two much criticized exhibition tournaments in Serbia and Croatia, the number one ranked tennis player in the world, Novak Djokovic, has tested positive for COVID-19. Djokovic received backlash for bringing players from all around the globe together for tournaments that didn't practice social distancing. Players were hugging at the net, posing for pictures together, even spent time socially together afterwards. Now, Djokovic is not alone. He's the fourth player who competed at these tournaments to test positive, and his wife also contracted the virus. 
Now, Djokovic said he will remain in self-isolation for 14 days and also apologize to anyone who became infected as a result of the series. But he has also previously said he is against taking a vaccine for the virus, even if it became mandatory for travel. And he is also a very well-known anti-vaxxer. I'm Rob Pizzo, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back to Here and Now. With many nursing homes across the country declaring their COVID-19 outbreaks over, new admissions are being allowed again. That means those at the top of long-term care waiting lists are being offered a bed. But some families have reservations about putting loved ones in a nursing home, especially with the potential of a second wave. Julie Ireton has more from Ottawa. Jill Vickers tends to her garden between visits to her 95-year-old mother who lives in a private retirement home nearby. Patricia Pryor lives here while she waits for a long-term care bed. She has advanced Parkinson's disease and some dementia. She's been on the waiting list for more than a year. The family has been told a new spot will soon be available, but still in the midst of a pandemic, Vickers isn't so sure about the decision to move her mom. And they give you two days notice, okay? 
So you have to accept it uh, within uh, 48 hours. And if they do that, if they stick to that rule, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people because I think people are going to find it difficult to make the, the judgment calls that uh, have to be made. This is a squirrel cage. Vickers says if they say no to the long-term care bed now, her mother goes back to the bottom of the waiting list. There's a call for the province to change that rule. What I think is the province should come out and say, if someone is uncomfortable moving into a long-term care home in the midst of a pandemic, then we will reserve their spot on the wait list until they're comfortable moving into it. Ontario has set new directives for those now being admitted into nursing homes. The care home has to be COVID-free. New residents must test negative for the virus. And once admitted, they must self-isolate in their new room for 14 days. We've heard from, uh, from members of CARP who have said, a bed became available for my mother, but I don't want to send her there because it would be a death sentence, potentially, as we head into what many are saying will be a second wave. Well, there probably will be a second wave. Um, my concerns are um, that there are clearly problems with the long-term care facilities. But Jill Vickers also knows her mother really needs the high level of care a nursing home can provide. And she realizes many families are in similar situations. For most families, or many families, it, it, there's no choice. You go to long-term care because you can't afford private. Julie Ayrton, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the British Prime Minister has revealed plans to begin major loosening of the nationwide lockdown. Starting July 4th, millions of people across England will be able to get a haircut, head to a pub, or visit a movie theater. Today, we can say that our long national hibernation is beginning to come to an end and life is returning to our streets and to our shops. Another update, some people in Britain need to keep one meter apart now rather than two so long as they take precautions and wear a mask. Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have independent plans to ease restrictions. Experts worry the government is reopening the economy too fast. While there has been a significant drop since the April peak, the country still has at least 1,000 new cases a day. Well, in other news, Britain's Postal Service will soon feature a very different queen on its stamps. Just a poor boy, nobody loves me. He's just a poor boy from a poor family. It's in honor of the group's 50th anniversary. The Royal Mail is honoring the iconic rock band Queen. The set of 13 stamps will go on sale next month. The artwork captures memorable images of the band and its extravagant frontman, the late Freddie Mercury. Queen is only the third music group to get a dedicated stamp issue in the UK after the Beatles and Pink Floyd.
Being a big guy or having facial hair, it's just hair, like it just grows. There's no reflection of the person you are based on your facial hair. Someone said it's, it's the beard that's on the inside that counts. It's about just showing people as people put on a tail, like now you're a merbi. It's not just about men in tails, it's about pretty much anybody in tails, and that's kind of the beauty of merbis. I want people in different ways to see men being depicted in ways that they're not used to seeing them. There will be some people who are maybe challenged by what they're seeing, but first and foremost, we're all gorgeous. Welcome back to Here and Now. A few months ago, Alan Mulholland set out on a two-year journey to sail around the world. The Prince Edward Islander spent more than three months in his boat and sailed over 14,000 kilometers before having to turn back. Despite the COVID crisis and a brutal boating accident, Mulholland has no regrets. Here he is describing the adventure. So this all started about two years ago. My wife said, uh, Alan, you need a project. You know, how about getting yourself a boat? And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. It took about a year's worth of work to get her ready, but then this is a boat that can really go anywhere. It's small, but it's tough. When I started out on this trip, the challenge was being on the ocean. It was all going great. Uh, this, this wave came along and, and it picked the boat up and it tossed it on its side, on the port side, with such a force that I ended up cracking a couple of ribs. It looked like it was going to put me off my schedule and I wouldn't be able to complete the around world trip. Within the two year safe window that I had, I had scheduled for, it was going to add another year plus considerable expense. And then COVID-19 hit. And when COVID-19 hit, everything changed. All the ports in the Caribbean had to close. Wherever you were, that's where you had to stay. I enjoyed myself despite the lockdown. I didn't get to travel around the Caribbean. I had to make a straight run from the island of Martinique all the way up to the Maritimes. And that's a trip that's very rarely done by anybody. In fact, it's probably one of the top five most challenging trips to make uh, nonstop, that is, in a small boat and especially solo. By the nature of an ocean-going boat, you, I carry supplies with me for six to nine months, so I can survive. Now, they're not going to be the best rations. It's mostly tinned food, and uh, you know I carry enough water for nine months. So I, I, I wouldn't starve to death, but I wouldn't be living it up either. I wanted an adventure, and I wanted the challenge at the beginning of the whole uh, uh, exercise. And I certainly got that. I got that and more, and I'm satisfied now with with all the, uh, you know, with all the challenges and adventure that I received over the last year. Well, sounds like quite the adventure. I can't imagine being out on the water alone for all of that time. Well, we've been talking a lot about the June holiday that happened yesterday. It's the day previously known as Discovery Day, but something we didn't mark yesterday was also St. John's Day. The city teamed up with the Spirit of Newfoundland for a special tribute video set to the famous St. John's Waltz. So we're going to leave you with some of that video tonight. See if you can spot some familiar faces. There's one, Chris Andrews. Oh, there are some more. Mayor Danny Breen, Patty Daly. We'll leave you up with this tonight. Uh, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. See you tomorrow.
and I'm sold, I'm going to see all the planes fill the skyway and the trains run swift and free. So leave the wayward free to wander. If it's rocks in the bay, if it's all cliché, you can find your...